All right. Good afternoon, everybody. So welcome to this uh, another lunchbox on press and I'm kind of going to give a nutshell, uh, an overall brief view on the press analysis in organic summer squash. So in a, in a, in a general view, or any time organic cultivation is a systems approach. So we have to look into not only the pests and the diseases, like as you guys can see here in the flow chart, we have to look into the soil health, we have to look into the pests and diseases and weeds. This is a... Leslie, do you have a, are you saying something? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was trying to give a reminder to everyone to mute their microphones. Meanwhile, I was already muted. So um, I just, sorry to interrupt Dr. Chaturi. I just wanted to uh, remind everyone now, please go ahead and mute your microphone. That way uh, on the recording, we don't have background noise um, and we can clearly hear what Dr. Chaturi is saying. Okay, that's all. That's my reminder. Yeah. So as a systems approach, we have to look into the soil health, we have to look into the pests and diseases and weeds. Though today we are focusing mainly on pests and diseases because if you don't look into the soil health, it's interrelated to pests and diseases. And of course, weeds, they kind of promote major insects that can damage the crop. So the first and the key requirement for the soil health is everyone has to get their soil test done so that we could follow the recommendations based on that we can give the fertility recommendation to the to the crops we are growing and i have just listed a couple of things like how you can improve the soil health like follow crop rotations cover crops use compost materials and coming to the pests and diseases so the critical thing is the pest management we use only omri approved pesticides biopesticides and also we have to look into increasing the biodiversity and encourage the natural enemies. So these are the pillars for each component. So th these things we have to keep in mind before we go ahead and do any pest, pest control strategies or looking into the improvement of soil health. And weeds, this is one key thing and the difficult thing in organic farming because we don't have a, a big choice of approved herbicides where we can spray and get rid of the weeds. The only way is going to be is either you, you have to hand weed or use mulches so that they could reduce the density of the weeds um, and some tillage practices. So our main focus today is, is the summer squash, which is cooked with a pepper. This is a warm season crop and it grows best at the temperatures, which is between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So this crop can be either planted directly with the seed or it can be transplants. So typically in summer squash, we can see two different kinds, two different types, yellow squash and zucchini. So as you can see from the picture here, I didn't know like they had eight different types of summer squash that are available. Um, you can buy in the markets and uh, I was really surprised. So I just wanted to share this picture with all of you. So. The summer squash, yellow summer squash, you can see straight neck, what we see here, and the crook neck. And whereas the zucchini, it's just one type, which is straight and green. So there are also other types, as I have shown in the, in the pictures, like, you know, the, the, the round ones, um, they're called as patty pan or scallops, and they're also cocozilla vegetable marrow. So I didn't really um, know what that was. Um, so based on the, the varieties, like what we are doing in this project, like you can see the important varieties here, um, Gentry, Zephyr, Spineless Beauty, and the criteria is most of them are hybrids, they're uniform in production, like in terms of yield, they're highly productive, and they're short duration, like with the harvest period is about 45 to 55 days. So coming to the insect pest management in summer squash, before I get into each pest and disease, I want to highlight some key things before we get into this pest management aspects. The timing of pest control is very, very important, which means we have to have a regular scouting plan. If you cannot scout the field, you are missing the window where you have to do your applications for the pest control. 
So at least you have to monitor randomly 10 plants in the entire field, like going from the edges to the rows to the middle of the field. So you have to choose about five to eight different locations in the field. In that way, we monitor and we scout and we see the distribution, like if there are any pests or any, any, any specific insects we are observing. So once we scout and identify, the important thing is where we have to able to identify the pest and what kind of a damage it can cause so that we can go on to the timely pest control sprays. So these are again the key pillars for us to for a successful pest management. The timing of pest control, you have to scout your fields, you have to monitor and see what are what what is in there in the system so that you know you don't miss the window of doing your pest control strategies in an effective way. So one of the, some of the key pests I'm going to focus today, as you can see, this is the striped cucumber beetle, and we also have the spotted cucumber beetle. So these are the two major cucumber beetles, and these are considered to be the most damaging pests because the larvae as well as the adults feed and the larvae particularly, they feed and damage the roots. They also transmit, this is in particular with the striper cucumber beetle, as you can see, three vertical bands, black bands alternated by yellow bands. So when we see in the field, like this is how you are going to see, because these are very quick flyers. So they kind of fly out, so, but, but at, a, at, a, at a glimpse of a second, we can identify, we can see like, hey, this is the cucumber beetle. So they transmit bacterial wilt disease, and these beetles, especially they overwinter, they overwinter and they become active as soon as the spring kicks in. So which means when the temperatures are about 55 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, the overwintering beetles, they emerge out of the soil and these females, they lay eggs in the soil at the base of the plant. So the eggs hatch about in 10 days and the larvae start feeding on the roots. So that's the critical damage they can cause. So it's very, very important. Even when you see one beetle, that's like an alarm, especially with these striped cucumber beetles, to follow some uh, spray schedule or spray, uh, spray so that we can control this pest, uh, this beetle at the initial stages before they can erupt into like major population. Again, this is the spotted cucumber beetle. As you can see, you can see spots on the body. So this is one key way like you can identify uh, in the field. It's not that difficult. Um, the adults are again, these are strong flyers. Both adults and larvae, they are polyphagous. They have multiple hosts. So cook, like squash is not the only, only host for them. So they can hibernate. That is the reason why they overwinter in other crops. But like squash is the most preferred crop for them. As soon as the early of the season kicks in, they emerge, these adults lay the eggs and the larvae start feeding on the roots. So they can produce about two, through, two to three generation in the short period of 40 to 45 days. So in the growing season, they can, they can generate two to three generations. So coming to the management, there are not very good organic insecticides available, but like they recommended, like based on the literature available, you can spray pyrethrin or neem extract, neem based extracts, because this can to some extent to deter the feeding as well as the OV position. The key component of neem is an OV deterrent and an anti feeding agent. So that can to certain extent, but this can help only when the plants are small and when you see only one beetle, when the initial population is like only one per plant. When the populations are multiplying, what, no matter what kind of an application you spray, it's not going to control the pests. So my, the other important thing is squash bug. So as you can see from the pictures here, this is how these adults are going to be like. You can very clearly identify in the field these adults are dark brown to gray in color. Like they lay eggs like this in a particular pattern, like a V-shaped pattern. And they are like yellowish brown to bronze color. You can anytime, like when you get into a squash field, as soon as you see these eggs, you can, they are very clearly visible, like tiny, tiny dots in a, in a V pattern. So when you see at least one egg mass, it's like an alarm that we have to go for uh, spraying so that we could control this population, the egg laying of the adult. 
So the later instars, these are the later instars, as you can see from the picture here, they feed in groups. So they are gregarious, they feed in groups and the extent of damage is very severe. So what they do is primarily they feed on the leaves, they secrete a highly toxic saliva as they feed and the leaves turn yellow and you can see here the necrotic, uh, necrotic lesions and the leaves start wilting which is called as anasa wilt. So these, these symptoms are very clearly evident in the field when you see the squash bugs. So the key thing is even if you see one egg mass, that's an alarm that we have to make sure, like you have to monitor the fields and scout the fields so that we don't explode these populations in the squash crop. So management, as I've been saying, timing is the key to the successful squash bug control. Um, it is very difficult if the populations are allowed to build. Early detection is very, very important because the adults are, the, the nymphs are very gregarious. They feed in groups. So it becomes difficult to, even if you spray, it becomes difficult to control them. So the recommended uh, biopesticides, pyrethrin and neem-based extra extracts because and these also work only on small instars or at egg stage because when you spray this, when the eggs hatch and the cat and the nymphs come out, like they are in the very, very, very in, in like the first instar stage. So this, the spray, whatever we are doing, can effectively work at the in, smaller instar stage rather than at the adult stage. So and even when we are spraying, the key thing we have to remember is you spray at the base of the plant down in the plastic holes because that is where the squash bugs kind of hibernate and brood at the base of the plant. So if you spray on the top of the plant, it's not going to help much. So you ensure that the sprays are directed at the base of the plant down in the plastic holes. So aphids, uh, most of you might have noticed these in your fields. Um, this is a small, soft-bodied insects. They vary in colors and size, like you can see these are the nymphs. They are yellow in color, orange in color, green in color, but particularly the common species we see in Southeast is the melon aphid. So they are winged and are wingless. So they can, the winged, they, they don't, they kind of transmit, they do a damage, but whereas the nymphs are the key things that cause damage to the crop. So they feed, if you want to see, if there are aphids in your field, the best way to see on the underside of the leaf. You don't see it. Whereas in case of squash bird, the eggs are laid on the surface of the leaf, on the top surface. Whereas aphids, they brood on the underside of the leaf. So they, once they feed, the growing tips, they become, they reduce the quality in terms of the fruit. The quality and quantity is affected. They release a sticky material. As you can see from the picture here, this is like the sooty mold, like a honeydew that is secreted in case of the fruits, it makes the fruit unmarketable because when you touch the fruit, it's going to be sticky and it makes unmarketable. So the key symptom when you have an aphid infestation, the leaves, they curl downward, they turn brown and they die. So these aphids, they also transmit a cucumber mosaic virus. So once they feed on the sap, the virus is transmitted. So again, the management aspect, as you can see, um, from the, the list, the literature that says like insecticidal soap and neem oil extract and pyrethrin. So this, because it's an organic management system, the choice of biopesticides or the products we could use for management of the sucking pests is very limited. So of course, neem oil, it's an anti, it's a OV deterrent and an anti feed -in. Um So the, these are the suggested uh, sprays for effort control. The squash vine borer. So this, it, because it depends on the region. Like in some areas, this is a very serious pest. Uh, as you can see from the pictures, like when you see flying, you think they are like big wasps that are flying, but they're not the wasp. They look like that. But these are the squash vine borer adult moths. And these moths are seen early during the summer. And these are daytime flyers. So they are not usually moths or nighttime. They, they come during the nights and they kind of deposit the eggs. But with the squash vine borer, these are the daytime flyers. So they lay, as you, you can see from the picture here, they lay the eggs singly on the stems and the leaf stalks and near the base of the plant. 
So as soon as these eggs, like you can see here, they are small, very, they are very, very tiny, oval, brown, and they hatch in about seven to 10 days. As soon as they hatch, they tunnel into the stems and they feed at the basal portion of the vines. So you cannot really see there is a squash vine borer feeding on your plant. The only evidence you can see is either the frass, like a feces, like you can see here, that is out of that hole that is ejected out or like a sawdust that you can see from these holes. So the symptoms, the plants will till the leaves turn yellow and eventually the, the margins are going to be brown and the, the plants are going to be uh, uh, very, very sick, sick in appearance. So how do we identify a wine borer, a squash wine borer damage? So the key thing here is you see a large swollen stem and you see large amounts of yellowish green frass from the holes. So this is the key thing, like in areas where there is squash vine border is a major problem. These are the key things you have to look into. You have a swollen stem and you have large amounts of yellow green frass that you can see from the holes. So coming to the, um, the management aspects, how best we can manage the squash uh, vine border. So the key thing is we have to look for the adult moths, that are flying around during the daytime. That's one key thing we can monitor. So the control tactics, whatever you can do, they can be done at this, like at the early stages, because once the larvae emerge out of the eggs, they're going to tunnel into the stems. So no matter what you spray, you're not able, you are not going to control because they tunnel into the stem and they feed inside the stem. So an early control is the best method and the best strategy. So neem-based extracts, because so even if, the, if, you, if you cannot see the eggs, if the eggs are laid, when you spray these neem, so the emerging larvae, they cannot feed and they die. So that is, that is the key thing they say, like use spraying neem-based neem extracts. And also the other thing, you have to rotate the crops. Like if you are growing, right now you are growing your squash crop in one region, you have to rotate it. If you have a, a squash vine borer problem, you have to move your squash to an other region in the field so that you are not repeating the cycle because these moths, they can, they can hibernate in the soil and then it can become a serious problem when you have the, uh, uh, the crop in the, same re in the same field, in the same place. So as you can see the symptoms here, so when the squash vine borer is infested, like you can see, like the plant is wilted pretty much like it looks like a dying plant. So this, that's the, the key symptom you can see, like a sudden death of the plant. So other pests, the two-spotted spider mite, it's a serious problem, at particularly when the weather is hot and dry. So these are like very, very tiny individuals. They feed on individual cells of the leaves. They form a web. So once they're like, you can see the adult here, like they has two tiny red spots. I mean, evidently when you are seeing in the field, you don't, it's not really visible to the naked eye, but this, the web is one key thing you can identify and and you can barely see like a spots, like two spots when these spider mites are there. So that's the key thing you can identify. So they, they, once they damage, the, the symptoms uh, like they appear as pale yellow, like you can, in small specks to large areas and you can see the symptoms on the upper side of the leaves. So the damage can be very quickly, which can result in the killing of the plant or seriously stunting the growth of the plant. So because of their small size, it's very hard to detect, like I said. So you have to make sure, like, you know, uh, we have to regularly monitor the plants and you have to always look on the underside of the lab, underside of the leaves or if you find any webs. So the best management strategy, they can, you can use neem oil extract, neem-based products, and the mites can be removed. There is also a natural way of controlling these mites. You can remove them with a strong spray of water. What it does is it kind of disperses the population and disperses the web. So you can use a strong spray of water even before you go for spraying the neem oil extract. So the natural predators, um, the ladybird beetles, they feed on these uh, spider mites and also the minute pirate bugs. Uh, they are the natural predators that can eat these uh, spider mites, which is one best way of naturally controlling the spider mites. Provided we do the spray applications uh, less frequently, only based on the threshold. 
like we see a certain number of insect pests, we have to opt for uh, spraying the biopesticides rather than doing a weekly pesticide spray so that that can enhance the biodiversity and the natural predator population in the field. So this is, when you see this picture, this is a squash beetle or the Mexican bean beetle, which is Epilacna. It looks more like a ladybird beetle, but this is not a ladybird beetle, but this can, this is very, like they are very few in numbers seen in the fields, but based on the visual sampling data we got from NC, North Carolina State University and Mississippi State University. So they reported some of the populations were recorded during the squash growing season. So I thought this would be a very good insight to the growers also to identify when you see the ladybird beetles are red in color, whereas this is like bright yellow in color. It kind of, it kind of fools you, indicating it looks like a ladybird beetle, but it's not a ladybird beetle. It's a bright yellow in color with the black spots on the outer side of the wings. So the both the, this is the larvae, as you can see from the picture. Uh, this is how it looks spiny. The adult looks entirely different from the larvae, the nymph. It looks more spiny. So this is how, if you are seeing any larvae in the field, it's the epilacna beetle, the Mexican bead beetle. So both the adults as well as the larvae, they feed around the leaf tissue. They feed in a pattern, like a semicircular pattern, and they consume uh, the leaf tissue. The adults leave the small veins, whereas the larvae, they kind of pretty much feed on the entire. Uh, so as you can see on the symptoms here, so this is the feeding damage you can identify in the field from the, epi from the, from the squash beetle damage. So this is the key pattern you can observe in the field in case if you have any uh, squash beetles in the field. So these are most in the late in the season. So in the early end of the season, they feed on the foliage, whereas in the late season, they, they feed on the rind of the squash fruit. So usually, like I said, uh, they cause extensive, when you see an extensive defoliation, then that's when we have to look into going for some effective control uh, management strategies. So pyrethrin, which is pyganic and spinocyte are effective in controlling this beetle. So other than the pests and diseases, so those are some of the key pests that you can see uh, in the squash crop. But also added to that, um, there are like in North Carolina, diseases is one of the major problem. And also in some of our field visits, we have seen diseases in the summer squash. So I just wanted to say, uh, throw an overall a general information on some key diseases, what you can see in the summer squash during the growing season. So the best way how you can prevent or minimize the diseases is by using simple cultural control practices. So what are they? Using a certified disease-free seed, using a disease-resistant varieties, keeping the surrounding field areas free of weeds because most of the weeds, they harbor insects and these insects are the main carriers of spreading or vectoring the viruses and the, and the diseases. So you have to keep your, the surrounding field areas free of weeds. In that way, you reduce the disease pressure in squash crop. And also, you have to remove timely plant debris immediately, especially after harvest. You just can't leave the, the, the waste there in the field because this debris also serves as a, as a reservoir for many diseases from year to year. So some of the key diseases, the bacterial wilt, of course, in cucurbits, you see a lot of other diseases that are prominent and, and, uh, and more dominant. But whereas in squash, uh, the intensity of diseases is little less. So bacterial wilt is one of the diseases which is caused by the bacteria. And this, like I showed in the pests, uh, like the spotted and the striped cucumber beetles, these are the carriers of this bacterial wilt. How this happens is this, these cucumber beetles, they feed on the plants and they carry and they transmit the and they spread the bacteria from a healthy plant from one plant to other plant and other plant to other plant. So that's why when I say in the control strategies, if you see a one single cucumber beetle, that's the time you have to go for controlling. Once the populations build up, you are promoting, it's going to cause damage in terms of feeding 
as well as also spreading the diseases. So what these beetles do is they carry from one plant to another plant. And as you can see the symptoms here, the leaves are wilted, the vines are like wilted. So it looks like the plants are dying. So as you can see from the symptoms, at a glance, when you get into the field, if, you, if you are, your control strategies are not timely and you miss the window, this is going to be the damage you see because of bacterial wilts coupled with this beetle damage. So because these are the carriers of the bacterial wilt. So the symptoms, like I said, wilting and the rapid death of the plant. So for this bacterial wilt, there is no specific chemical control because once the plant is infected, it's infected because you cannot control the, the, the bacterial wilt. So the, for the key strategy, you have to control the beetles at the first sign so that you don't further the progress, they don't progress to the other plants and then you can limit, limit the spread of this bacterial wilt disease. Another one is the powdery mildew. Uh, this is mostly seen in lately planted squash. So this disease you can see when the temperatures are between 50 and 90 degrees foreign heat, which means the weather is dry and the relative humidity is extremely high. So this kind of promotes the powdery mildew, which is a fungal disease. The spores kind of multiply at these temperatures. And you can see on the upper surface of these leaves and stems, you see like a powdery patches on the leaf. Um, and uh, mainly it is to the vegetative growth. The fruits are not directly affected with this powdery mildew, with this, uh, with this fungal disease, but they can affect the, the vigor of the fruits, which means they can reduce the size and the growth can be stunted. And another disease is downy mildew. Uh, this is also caused by a, fung uh, by a fungus. And this is mostly favored during moist conditions, like where you have more amount of like, whether you are over irrigating or like you have more rains you see in the, in the fields, this, this is the fungus that is mostly favored during moist conditions. So the symptoms, this is on the lower side of the leaf. As you can see, these are the black spores because this is the fungus, they kind of, they, they disperse um, in, uh, as black spores. So, so this is the lower side of the leaf. You can see the spores. Whereas when you see on the upper side, you see the downy mildew like a, like a dips on the leaf where you can see like this brownie, uh, this brown irregular margins as well as uh, the withering and dying of the tissue on the upper surface of the leaves. So once the leaves are infected with this downy mildew, the leaves curl, uh, they curl upward, uh, inward, which means you see a curling on the, on the inward side. And so what you have to see is if it is a downy mildew or not, when you look on the bottom side of the leaf, like I am showing here in the slide, so the spores are going to be seen on the lower side of the leaf. Only on the upper side, you see the downy mildew, like a, a brown bumpy growth on the leaf. So the best way to control the downy mildew is again using disease resistant varieties. Yes, Janine. Yes. Is there any uh, approved uh, Fungicide for those, uh, mm -mm. A, a substitute of those that uh, uh, Dr. Chituri was talking about? Unfortunately, in my experience, not really. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this problem. We did that organic cucurbit project with Cornell a few years ago, and it's all in the variety selection. And my experience with hops, with our organic producers, it's downy and powdery mildews are what took them out of production as organic growers. Wow. So that's why it's so very, very important. I'm so glad to see that the organic breeding is con continuing. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, I'll make myself a note to send us all the information on some of the most recent varieties mm -hmm. that Michael Mazurik and uh, Edmund Frost have, have released that are good okay. for us. I'm gonna make yourself a note right now. And those are also squash varieties? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in you in specific to powdery and downy mildew? Yes, particularly downy. Oh, okay. And they have been doing more work with the winter squashes mm -hmm. than with the summer squashes at the present time. Yeah. But the work with the winter squashes has been very very impressive. So so the varieties that we are using now they are susceptible to 
to those uh, fungal diseases, huh? To the best of my knowledge. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, Anita, did we see any of those last yes. year in any of the fields? Yes, I think in Yawa's field we saw that. But we, when by the time we got the samples, I think is that right, Dr. Kwaku? We were we were predicting as uh, downy mildew. Yes, we did see that in Yawa's uh, uh, squash crop. Okay, and mm -hmm. uh, not uh, not on our uh, experimental field. In no, Tuske no, no, Tuskegee, no, no, North Carolina or Mississippi. I think that uh, Margaret was mentioning about. Uh, the disease problem but i don't have that information but mississippi they have not reported anything last season but we did see in some of the growers fields okay uh, uh Janine, okay when you are sharing those uh, varieties that are released uh, could you uh give us the name of those varieties or maybe you know we should be able to mm. to try to test them and see Yes. Okay. I will look for that. There was an article that just came out on that in the past week or so about the work from that. So let me find that article. I know I saved it. Um, I do know that most growers, organic growers, try to avoid these diseases by doing some succession plantings and hoping to hit a season where that downy isn't present. And with the summer squash, it's a short enough season that sometimes they're successful in that way. Some of the growers are reporting success with neem, but I've not really seen it. I don't know mm -hmm. how much of it that just gives them some sense of they're doing something. Satisfaction. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for the information, Janine. Sure. I was looking on the Omri approval uh, fungicide site and there was a there's a product called monterey bicarb fungicide have you ever heard of that janine or dr pomlaku yes i have and and thank you for bringing that up um i have a contact with that company that i should get up with he's expressed interest in working with us and maybe we can do a little bit of work on that i'll, I'll talk to our pathologist about that okay i put a link in the in the chat uh, that should go out to everyone. I'm not, I just wanna say, I'm not proposing this or supporting in, from the project. This is not, <laughs> this isn't supporting this fungicide, but I was just, cause since we were talking about OMRI approved fungicides, I thought I'd go ahead and take a look. Oh, okay, uh, uh, Anita, yes. may, it might be a good idea for us to look into that and have it in our toolbox. You know, that, yeah. uh, that, uh, yeah. uh, Fungicide that uh, Leslie is talking about. Yeah. Yes, yeah, just, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just con uh, check on that and see if it's not uh, too expensive. We need to have it, you know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Dr. K, check in the chat too. Uh, you, sh you, sh you should have a link to it. I'll go ahead and send it by email as well. There's another one called mildew cure fungicide for powdery mildew control. Um, anyway, so yeah, this is great. We will do some, some additional looking into this and definitely share what we find. Yeah, I yep. think that that's a good idea with, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the variety that, uh, the resistant varieties that uh, Janine talked about. So we'll have okay. those two, yeah. Sure thing, we'll follow up on that. We will make sure that those OMRI approved lists get up on the, on on the, the website, e -organic, yeah. on the e-organic site if it's not already there. But I'm, I think it probably is there, but I will double check on that. For yeah, sure. because OMRI already has that list, we can just add it to the... OMRI has a list of fungicides and, mm -hmm. and everything. It's already there. They, they already have the list. So we yep. find a way of sharing it. Yeah, that yeah. might be a, a good idea to put just uh, a link. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes to our site, there's a link, a link to, to the uh, uh, OMRI approved uh, list that is somewhere. Definitely. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you.
But I just, this is no Alice, problem. I just wanted to add that we always put, when we have something on our website about products like that, we always put a little disclaimer that says to check with your certifier and to make sure that the product is approved in your state and mm -hmm. local area and that you're mm -hmm. using it according to the instructions and stuff like that. We always put that, and I think that would be good to put up with the list of pesticides because sometimes even if it's an OMRI approved product, there might be some issue with your certifier or with the state and local area. So I just wanted to bring up that point. Excellent point, Alice. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, uh, it, just, just to um, add to that, even for the conventional growers, every now and then you have a, a pesticide that is registered for use in every but state <laughs> apart from a particular state. Uh, or the, the pesticide is registered for use in the United States apart from Maryland. <laughs> uh, so it's always good to, it may be a registered product, but it may not be registered for use where you are. So for that reason, you have to find out and you have to find out, for, especially if it doesn't have the OMRI label, then it becomes even more critical that you talk to your certifying uh, organization before you use it. There are some products, if you have a major pest problem and there is no good product that can deal with it, that is OMRI listed, and you say, I found this product, and sometimes they ask you to show what it contains, and every now and then sometimes they look at it, it doesn't have the OMRI label, but your certifying organization can allow you to use a, that product if you give them ample notice and then they look at it. That can happen often, but uh, every now and then when there's a new pest problem where they don't have um, a product that is listed that is really good and you, you find something you want to use, they want you to declare what it contains and then they might give you permission to, to use that. It doesn't happen often, but it happens. Uh, Franklin, uh, I just want to have uh, this clarification. Even though a product is OMRI approved, it could be only approved in certain states. Is that what it is? Every pesticide. Uh -huh. Does it happen often for the organic pesticides like it happens for the conventional pesticides? A pesticide is approved, registered for use in the United States, but they might say, Alabama, it's not registered for use in Alabama. No, I understand that in general for pesticide, but for OMRI approved. I've, I've not run into that problem with the okay. OMRI approved products, but it always helps to contact your local extension agent and, uh, and then talk to the certifying organizer. You don't want to, sometimes there's peculiar about your area or something and they are restricting a product. Doesn't happen often for the organic products though, but it doesn't hurt. Especially when we are seated here making recommendations that cover a wide swath of areas. We want the farmers to be communicating with their extension agents so that if there are problem issues associated with some specific areas, that will come up. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good idea because that's what uh, 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 Alice covered, saying that, yes, you yes. know, they put the disclaimer there, check with exactly. your uh, certifier. So I think yes. that we need to have that one also. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. And I will go ahead and just say while we're on this OMRI topic that OMRI does have uh, a website and it's www.omri.org for those of you that have not uh, been there or seen that yet. So always a good idea if you're an organic growing or transitioning to organic growing to um, know what's on that list. And uh, then as Dr. Parku said, make sure you're approving it. If you have any questions about any products at all, please send those uh, by email or you can call us uh, and we will make sure uh, that before it gets in your, uh, in your soil or on your plants uh, that it's been approved by this project. Um, it probably wouldn't help. I mean, it wouldn't hurt. So do, do we have some uh, growers or attending this uh, launch box yeah we've got yawa on the line uh we've mm -hmm. got mr copeland mm -hmm. do, do they have questions uh, probably looks like we've got mr jones on the line 
Any questions from our growers? All right, well, if the, any other last remarks from our research team? Well, uh, just it's, go just ahead. Want to, just want to update from Yava probably later once she's going to replant the squash. Uh, maybe I think that information is important to us to track back with her. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, Yawa, we'll check back in with you. Is okay. there anyone from is anyone from Mississippi? Our partners there? Casey or uh, is it Tom see. Thomas? Okay. Don't think they're on today. Okay. Janine, have you started any planting already? Not quite yet, and I'm glad we didn't because we had such, such terrible rains on Friday that we would have had to replant if we did. <laughs> okay, well, here we planted already our tomatoes. Uh, probably this week also we are planting the squash. Yeah, remember, we can still get frost up until about May 10th. So. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you're not going to plant anything until after May 10th, right? Um, it might not be quite that late. I think we've got some stuff going in earlier, but I don't have that planting calendar right in front of me. Okay. All right. Anything, anything else from our research team or anyone? Uh, uh, this, is Robert, this is Robert Jones from North Carolina. Hi, Mr. Jones. I have scores. Yes, I transplanted some squash today, and even though the plant has three leaves, I observed what may be pile of mildew at this early stage. So, what should I do? <laughs> we 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 are in the process of figuring that out, Mr. Jones. Um, let's see, we've okay. got. That uh, we, we actually, yeah, that's been, um, I'm not sure if you've been with us the whole time, but that has been the, the hot topic today. So uh, we are going to look into that. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Korku or, or Dr. Pomlaku or Dr. Chaturi have any thoughts on that. Okay, because I died in halfway through the meeting. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no problem. Not, not, not a problem at all. We were actually probably right there towards the end. Uh, where we were talking about that this has been an issue uh, dealing with the uh, that particular issue with squash. So, uh, Dr. Chaturi or Dr. Korku, any thoughts on on that, or should we just um, get back? Maybe get that information can, maybe out? can he have the sample verified because powdery mildew at this stage I think would be too early. But again, we can't rule it out. So, is there a way he could? have somebody like an extension agent or somebody close by, he could show it and confirm it. So meanwhile, we can look what is the armory approved uh, fungicide that he could use. Uh, that would be the first step I propose. I'm, and maybe Dr. Franklin can comment. Mr. Jones, do you have uh, an extension agent close by? Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you ask them to confirm and then you can always send in any question, any samples that you have, um, you can send those in to us. Um, he's, we've got a great disease and insect clinic and some real experts on the Did I cause that? I don't think so. No. <laughs> I don't think so, Dr. Davis. But yeah, if, Robert, if you could get that into your extension agent, um, that would be great. Or, you know, you can even send a sample in yourself. I'm going to send you that information. So I think okay, they fine. Went out some last year, didn't they? I didn't understand your statement. Um, didn't didn't you have an agent come out last year to take a look at some of your plants? Uh, yes, uh, my sweet potato plant, yes. 
Yeah, I give them a buzz again. I mean, you can send a sample in, and I'm going to send that information out to you in just a moment on how to do that yourself. Um, you can also do really good pictures, but I don't know. The pictures you send us are pretty small. I don't know if those would work for, to get a diagnosis. But you okay. can definitely get some samples into the clinic. And if you call them up, they'll tell you exactly what parts to bring, and they'll help you send it off to the clinic. Uh, yeah. Okie doke. Jenny. Yes. Um, uh, if you have any information uh, for that uh, powdery mildew that you could share with us, I mean, like with the team or with the partners, that will be great. Um, like whatever you are planning to send to Mr. Jones. Okay. So if you can share a copy, that would be great for us to, yeah. Yeah, we just, we've got some people that are really, and we've got a good cucurbit program here. And Alina Casada is our um, plant pathologist that works with that. So she's pretty on top of that. We usually get a diagnosis pretty quick on those. Having a big cucumber industry in the state helps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, if no one has anything else, it is one o'clock on the dot. And so we will call it a wrap. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Dr. Chichori, thank you so much for your presentation today.